Hello everyone and happy July the 4th to the majority of my audience that comes from the United States. This is the first time we talk about the American War of Independence. Never made videos about this before. We can make them, so this is just my very short introduction video type. And it's naturally challenging for me to talk to an at least historically interested audience who comes from the very country that I'm going to, to discuss uh, and uh, that are habituated to much broader and insightful uh, historical information than I am, let aside my poor linguistical skills, but I'll try my best at least also for, for the other uh, audience that maybe just, or everybody may be interested in how I read this. It's, uh, of course, not just a, a crucial historical um, topic and a very educational one, strategically speaking. I had the pleasure at some point of studying in detail some battles of the American War of Independence, especially the Battle of Long Island, which is fantastic in many ways uh, from a tactical point of view, and in others. Princeton, German town that was quite echoing um, in the world at the time for the for for Washington's almost success fundamentally in ruining the British army after having suffered defeat just a few weeks before. But it's also you know a very actual topic from basically all the political, military and social points of view you can can imagine also for how the war was objectively led because it's very similar frankly to um, a situation that we're living right now and that especially if we um, are going at some point to get a bit more in depth uh, with the uh, with the, with the issue with the topic and the strategy of the American War of Independence will probably realize better but these points go a bit beyond of course they touch the um, this pivotal moment in uh, late modern uh, history and, and and properly the concept of modernity in itself that is very much debated today and in, in, ma in many ways it's misinterpreted but it has let's say pros and cons and in a way it's always up to us to to get the the best out of something and you know realizing what are the other things that do not really work and I think that it's important to leave the spirit of the American War of Independence that however aside from the national mythology that is also fascinating and properly the uh, political religion that the uh, at this point just the American conservatism frankly maintains in a, a recognizable way there is something even beyond and more disconcerting for which I would like to, to start the video with the famous interview in 1842 that uh, Mellon Chamberlain who would later become one of the leading historians of the causes of the American War of Independence made to um, some of the few veterans of that war and among them in particular Captain Preston that was 91 at the time would have died a couple of years later who had participated in the action uh, at uh, Concord Bridge and Preston's answers to Chamberlain's questions are perhaps the best uh, indicator, one of the most eloquent that could ever be given regarding the meaning of the American War of Independence. And you could even stop the video at that if you if you're interested um, in the in the sap of it all. So the interview sounded it was a longer one, it sounded like this. Did you take up arms against intolerable oppression? Answer. Oppressions? I didn't feel them. Question. Didn't you feel overwhelmed by the stamp duty? Answer. I never saw one of those stamps and always understood that Governor Bernard put them all in Castle William. I am certain I never paid a penny for one of them. Question. And what about the tea tax? Answer, tea tax. I never drank a drop of that stuff. The boys threw it all overboard. Question, I suppose you, heard, you, you read Harrington, Sidney, and Locke on the eternal principles of liberty anyway. Answer, never heard them. We read only the Bible, the Catechism, Watts, Psalms, and Hymns, and the Almanac. 
Question. So what was the problem and why did you go fighting? Answer. Young man, what we meant in going for those red coats was this. We always had governed ourselves and we always meant to. They didn't mean we should. So the, the extraordinary epic that led to the independence of the United States of America originated in a much wider conflict that, of course, is also a product of other conflicts that occurred before. We're talking about the Seven Years' War, 1756-1763. This was, in a sense, it's called as kind of the first world war, in a sense, because it was the stemming from a first global-scale conflict, a kind of um, in fact, for view of the First World War, from the European theater, the fire infected Africa, Asia, and the Americas. In fact, North, in North America, France and Great Britain had already been fighting each other since 1754 in a long-standing struggle for colonial supremacy. Um, as you know, the American colonies of the British were the most prosperous, by far the most populated, um, the the ones also habituated to to larger uh, uh, autonomy, and uh, they had been left largely in a mercantilistic fashion, you know, just having this contact with the motherland, uh, for which their goods had to pass through it. That Britain had a monopoly on them. Now France was defeated, as we know, in the Seven Years' War. And Great Britain inherited her dominions, and in particular a huge strip of land between the 13 British colonies and the Mississippi River, which lapped the ice of the Arctic Circle to the north and flowed south to the Gulf of Mexico. The war had, again, been quite complex and not really decided in North America. That was a relatively peripheral strategic context in a sense but still the uh, the changes had been enormous exactly for this because the presence of Europeans was relatively recent after all and so this but their superiority had allowed them to control this enormous amount of land uh, the British economy however did not benefit from the new conquest, because the very high cost of, of the war had enormously burdened the sovereign debt and the unexplored and wild American priories produced no income, but at that moment, for that moment, only other expenses of defense, garrison, that, as we will see, will be central, actually, in the issue with the, with the colonists. Britain had, in fact, the urgent need for a radical and costly administrative, organizational and military restructuring of that portion of her empire. New uh, indigenous tribes to control, 80,000 Franco-Canadian citizens to assimilate, a colonial budget that had quintupled from 70,000 to 350,000 pounds from 1748 to 1763, requiring drastic measures to cope with it, uh, and consider that France was always looming, as the same war of independence would show. So, was it really a complicated situation? The military, one in particular, required the permanent settlement of at least 10,000 soldiers in a widespread system of garrisons to protect the colonists. And an act of attention to uh, their safety that the American colonists themselves, however, did not appreciate at all. Uh, Great Britain had, uh, in fact, as we've seen, granted colonies great autonomies since their foundation. Without a real colonial policy, it had basically limited itself to applying the dictates of the mercantilist economy, according to which every colonial trade had to transit to the motherland and on national vessels, the tax burden on the colonists did not reach 
consider this even in, just in relation to our times. Not that that one percent was um, that low, considering the. Let's see, here we're still in a sort of pre-industrial reality after all. It was just beginning to be industrial. It was not a few for the surplus of the time, but still, overall, was this perceivable? For example, I remember the interview we just read. In an economy like the American one, where 9 out of 10 citizens were practically self-sufficient farmers, not only could taxes be easily evaded, but it was above all difficult to impose and demand them. Right? This will be a problem, also strategically speaking, during the war, because the British Army and the Royal Navy could fundamentally uh, successfully, at least not always, telling the truth, control the coastal areas, the ports, and even the the some the, of the rich farmlands of the immediate interland. But the majority of the, the inhabitants lived in the interland and were fundamentally autonomous from the cities and scattered also on a considerable amount of territory that, as we will see, was also becoming a bit the problem uh, as well. The London Parliament was now determined to exercise greater authority over the colonies, reducing their wide margins of self-government, and at the same time wanted to find employment for the 1500 aristocrats and influential British officers who, after the end of the Seven Years' War, had remained unemployed. He therefore resolved to proceed with unprecedented firmness, a part of the expenses actually quite reduced, uh, would have be to be covered with, with new taxes, while military easements would have facilitated the transit and quartering of troops. The colonists' protests were immediate. They were men for the most part devoted solely to the care of their fields and without reading behind them, apart from, from the Bible, except for the very few who participated in the Enlightenment ferments by cultivating Republican and liberal ideas, the others knew for sure only that they had always governed themselves and wanted to continue to do so. They contested, as we've seen, not so much the taxes, but the very usefulness of the garrisons, especially after the expulsion of the French from the continent that they had contributed to with their militias next to the British army and proposed to use for the new garrisons the local militias of poor military reputation but still up to the task of defending the frontier fundamentally and militias that were already financed by local legislators and the militias naturally are a bit the the core question of the initial uh, organizational issues of the the American army, the Continental Army, and they were experienced in, in warfare as far as militias could be. They could watch their boundaries from, from the Indians and even expanding further, and this was also the issue in part. And in this aspect that the Parliament uh, was not seen, in fact, that both the taxes and the military occupation touched sensitive towards for a British citizen, as the colonists still viewed themselves, regardless of their more or less loyalist feelings. Right? They were essentially to protect their common law, and certain freedoms that were given uh, as natural and pre-existing, pre and actually, you know, the same government, and for which government had been created to, to, to defend. For centuries, the subject of His British Majesty had traditional rights, including that of not being able to be taxed except by decision of their own representatives and to be adequately consulted for any military service. However vague the concept of representation might have been at the time, I mean, only one in 20 British citizens had the right to vote. In fact, no parliamentarian was elected in the 13 colonies, which represented an impossible contradiction to resolve. Particularly controversial was the function of military garrisons. King George III, in order to consolidate the acquired territories, had guaranteed the native tribes 
that any future purchase of land in the so-called Indian reserves that were just essentially west of the Appalachian Mountains and were partially also, you know, open, frankly, to, to, to the colonial expansionism would be conducted by consensus of the royal officials. Um, this was important also to keep partially the, the Indians at, at bay, right? The, the well-founded belief of the colonists that those garrisons served said to slow down, even if only momentarily, their race towards the West further exacerbated them. Uh, the, the various British colonies in America were also actually quarreling among each other regarding these issues. They drew different lines within which the colonists would have to expand. They, there was not really even a unitary uh, American feeling as one would, would feel it like. Again, these were British subjects and uh, their own, each colony ha was, was a world on its own in a sense. It's quite different, uh, you know, ranging, thinking even about just the distances, the latitude, right? There were essentially one well, million and, and a half uh, heading towards the two million inhabitants scattered, again, you know, but face but just imagine how it could be at the time, you know, just to leave in a world like this. Now, the decade 1763, 1773, however, so an escalation of new impositions from the British and uh, increasingly lively reactions on the part of the colonists. Attacks on sugar imports, severe limitations on the issuance of paper money, the obligation to bear the expenses for the quartering of the troops, renewed by official reaffirmation by Parliament of the right to be able to legislate on behalf of the colonies without any limitation. There were laws that had been issued back in the beginning of the century that had remained on paper and in terms of these regulations. Now Britain was essentially resuming part of them and adding the new ones to increase the, uh, the revenues and or to coerce the colonists in the you know, in the management properly of the royal government policies. And convinced of their own reasons, the Americans took the road of civil protest. And not only that, they began a systematic boycott of British products and sent petitions to the king to defend them from abuses by parliament, which was an interesting move because essentially they were asking George III to mediate Right with the parliament, which could not really be done. You know that after the Glorious Revolution, the um, the English monarchy had, uh, the British monarchy had later had uh, fundamentally been in a second place uh, after the, the parliament in, in, pr in practical political terms. These were terms, also especially later during the Napoleonic Wars, in which the monarchy gained still more more power, but they. Um, th it was possible, let's say, to see still, and this is the important aspect of the American Revolution that is too easily, you know, explained through the idea of modernity. This was not a rejection of the uh, Ancien Regime per se, right? This is more an idea that we developed later for other ideological reasons. This was still a view for which, you know, these people were traditionally free in their rights and were to be protected by the king that was seen as the lawful authority in order to to exercise this 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 power so um uh, th there are also some uh let's say less romantic uh, realities such as as we will see in fact that much of this resistance was also carried out by smugglers that were factually the mob that uh were circumventing habitually and traditionally the you know, what, what the British law had issued to, to be just uh, essentially a state monopoly of trade. Um, and so we're talking about different backgrounds, different ideas, different lifestyle, etc. But they all um, gathered around the, um, you know, the realization that such impositions were considered as fundamentally legitimate because of the pre-existing 
uh, rights of, of of the colonies. Um, the, the most vocal uh, at the same time attacked those who sold the hated stamps in print, government officials and collaborators, some of whom suffered also violent retaliation, like the humiliation of being covered in pitch and feathers. The victim was stripped, sprinkled with pine pitch and covered with feathers, then exhibited in the city streets astride uh, a pole. Uh, if if they were lucky, some were, were, were hanged. But the most painful part consisted in cleaning off the sticky mixture. Still, if you if you were not, uh, you know, brought under other surplus, for its part, the British army, um, responsible for compliance with the laws, was daily engaged in facing mobs, and therefore exposed to repressive excesses, which culminated culminated in the famous Boston massacre, so called, of March the fifth, seventeen seventy, when the English infantrymen caused five deaths by firing on a crowd of protesters. The growing level of violence opened uh, a faro among the Americans themselves who were increasingly divided between pro-monarchist loyalists and republican separatists. The, the parties, and albeit owing uh, very often kind of more variegated uh, views on, on the same position, perched on questions of principle and did not intend to yield. Um, so this was a truly vertical division in many ways, also outside the colonies. For example, the native tribes had reacted violently to the transition to British sovereignty. Uh, the French were considered allies by the local tribes, while the British antagonized them by presenting themselves as the new masters. From 1763 to 1766, uh, they fought them in the uh, Pontiac War, named after one of their leaders, the leader of the Ottawa. The ferocity of the war, however, had convinced King George III to set the aforementioned border dotted with garrisons between the 13 colonies and the Indian Reserve, a decision that, as we have seen, was one of the causes of the colonial uprisings, but also a reason for joining the loyalist cause of many tribes. The Vatauga Association, the Cata Bay, and the Lenap sided with the with the Americans, uh, with the British. Uh, the Cherokee, the Creek, the Seminole, the Chick, uh, Sows, and the Choctaws. Members of the Mohawks fought for both sides. The real upheaval, however, was caused within the six nations of the Iroquois Confederation. Tuscarora and Oneida sided with the colonies, while Onondaga, Seneca, and Cayuga remained loyal to the British. It's estimated that approximately 13,000 natives fought on the British side during the American Revolutionary War, with the largest group from in, coming from the Iroquois tribes, who deployed around 1,500 men. Colonel, so-called colonel, uh, uh, Joseph Louis Cook was the most famous war chief. He was an Afro-French mixed blood who led the Onedas alongside the Americans. The American Revolution also divided African Americans, freemen or slaves that they were. The former mostly were close to the colonists, such as Crispus Attucks, the first victim of the Boston Massacre the latter to the British, who were thought to be intent on abolishing slavery, right? And uh, promising that, especially in exchange for military service and the granting of freedom also promised by the northern colonies, caused a mass exodus from, of, uh, from the southern plantations, which caused a profound labor crisis with serious consequences also in, in the post-war period when an intense internal slave market caused social and demographic upheavals.
we're talking about um, you know also tens of thousands of African Americans died um, during the war for various reasons, but many properly fled. Um, others, uh, as we'll see, that they were also joining the British and being brought elsewhere. But this system unhinged um, a previous situation that fermentively balanced um, as well and set the you know some some issues that in a sense seem to be even reminiscent of the ones of the uh, of the civil war uh, between north and south around 5000 african americans served in the continental army and navy in in a variety of roles while another 4000 were employed in the patriot militia units aboard private years or as uh, teamsters servants and spies um, and after the war, a small minority received land grants, even as the other colonists, um, or congressional pensions in old age. But many others were returned to their masters um, after the war, uh, despite earlier promises of freedom. Uh, also, many of the pro-British African Americans fled to Canada after the war and from there followed different paths. Some remained in America, others moved to England and a last part returned to Africa, settling in Sierra Leone. The loyalist provincial militias of whites and free blacks as well as loyalists with their slaves were transported in a relocation to Nova Scotia and the British Caribbean. Now, the British first wave of fiscal measures on the colonies was followed by taxes on paper, glass and tea, the latter famous for the enterprise of the Boston Tea Party, the group of colonists, uh, patriots, uh, some of them disguised as Indians, who reacted on December the 16th, 1773 to the tax by throwing a shipment of tea. Uh, from the Company of the Indies into the waters of Boston Harbor. Um, the, the, the East India Company had been in dire financial straits and uh, the British had fundamentally granted a full monopoly on the, the tea uh, uh, trade to the colonists. And, and this had produced, in fact, the side of the smugglers, among them were, you know, they were great context with the Dutch in this sense that were not um, a major power uh, anymore like at the beginning of the century but still had maintained this very important trade context with the the American colonies and later would also side with them uh, in the war suffering uh, dramatically in turn um, from the British economical retaliations that crashed their, their system let's say and the British response uh, to these uh, manifestations was a, essentially a series of coercive measures, including the blockade of the Boston port until the payment of damages, which was never carried out because events were now destined to precipitate the world's war. Right? Boston was renowned, the most important port in the colonies, was also producing 50% of the Royal Navy tonnage. Right in the shipyards, and, and there was a, a crucial also the, the eventual loss of America was was remarkable um, in effects in this sense. Uh, in 1774, the first Continental Congress convened in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, attempting the charter of a final petition to the king, calling itself into a subsequent second congress to discuss the the answer and in reality every state was already preparing for war autonomously by arming and training militias and the the first armed confrontation anticipated the king's decision according to the words of the american poet ralph waldo emerson on april the 19 1775 the shot heard round the world was fired in Concord. Mm-hmm. Lexington and Concord, those were the first clashes that were fought 
essentially over the control of uh, ammunition depots that uh, was revealing of course what what, what was the climate uh, there um, and this first shot uh, the first shot of a war definitely destined to mark our modernity. Um, a challenge to absolutism taken up by King George III, who, renouncing the role of paternal mediation desired by many moderates on both sides of the Atlantic, there was an important public uh, support in Europe and Britain even uh, towards the revolutionary cause, um, interpreted the more, in a sense, grim and rigid face of the Loyalist Party in, in America as well, declaring that the colonies were in rebellion to the king, and that the seditious deserved no other response than strength. And this, this, the, the meaning of it all, of course, is goes beyond in many other ways. It was a particular situation. Uh, this was essentially a, um, a Western power, yet essentially fighting for its own independence in, in a non-European country, which was the first time. Right? So it was remarkable for the same. And an already accomplished extension of Westernness beyond the old world. The Continental Army, as the newly formed American Armed Forces were called, placed under the command of the Virginian George Washington, immediately took the initiative attacking enemy garrisons and forcing, in the spring of 1776, all British troops to retreat to the naval base of Halifax in Nova Scotia. Um, interestingly enough, the... the, 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 the say it's kind of ironic the British had tried to direct uh, colonial the colonist expansionism given that he didn't want to go west into the so-called Indian reserves uh, to press them towards north and the south right either in fact Nova Scotia or Spanish Florida and this was a success that the rebels were waiting for to pronounced their declaration of independence, voted on July the 2nd and published on July the 4th during the proceedings of the Second Continental Congress. So, this always deserves a pronunciation. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. This is the very famous second sen sentence of the Declaration of Independence of the United States of America, easily together with Liechtenstein and Switzerland, the, the most beautiful constitution uh, in, in history. And the in a way, the interpretative key, according to Abraham Lincoln, but also the, the most iconic and echoing right, of the entire American Constitution and of the role of Americans in the world as a nation. And this assertion, inserted in a, essentially a declaration of war, uh, besides one of independence, evidently did not refer to a private and personal context, but bound the same function of government not only to the protection, but to the promotion of those evident truths. And there is no time to digress on, on the beauty of the concept in itself that naturally has created enormous um, issues in, in its interpretation by the, some of the most irreconcilable political movements, but the deep roots of, of these ideas date back to the Stoicism of Seneca, to the Protestant Reformation of Martin Luther, and to the Enlightenment thought of the philosopher John Locke. However, the writers of the document, and in particular 
its first author, Thomas Jefferson, must be acknowledged having distilled these precursors in a new and original form which gave an incredible and definitely the most irresistible impulse to modernity. That, this is the point, was not modernity, it was the reaffirmation of some universal values that what we call as like, we indicate normally as modernity is actually already the incarnation of that in the same absolutism and in other despotic and sclerotic systems in any case uh, the implementation of those principles uh, would be famously taken up by the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948 it's quite eloquent that uh, around the same time it dates the uh, renewed international American commitment with you know an alliance with other nations which basically didn't happen after the uh, the war of independence until in fact NATO was founded this is also very interesting and relevant for today's world um, and naturally we, we're talking about 1776 so a moment in which um, would have not been either immediate nor easy for those for, for those words that are apparently so clear to be properly received and assimilated and developed and, and, and properly understood and so this is what brought to still today to the most diverse um, interpretations inspiring the most irreconcilable political uh, ideas in a way and this is not a good sign frankly because you know whoever studies the the philosophy uh, the culture the you know the the, the background properly of, of the founding fathers realizes that the meaning is comprehensively quite specific right and it's our lack of systemic awareness about broader cultural issues that mostly makes us blind today to something that for them was in fact really self-evident right those truths being self-evident that's a very powerful line because it means basically that whoever is exposed to these truths immediately recognizes them which is an enormous concept and it does really date back to much at, at the very roots of western identity in any case the diligence of the congress of the newborn united states of america in declaring its secession was more than opportune the british were in fact launching a powerful counteroffensive landing in New York with 30,000 men under the command of General William Ho uh, immediately joined by the militia town that defected the independence cause right it was much of an option frankly um, New York will become till the very end of the war the uh, the British base of operation and considered that the you know we're talking about 30,000 men that they increased Part, but um, Washington never had more than 17,000 men under his direct command right and as we will see the Americans won but suffering um, disproportionately larger losses than the British which is also something that strategically speaking uh, not just makes a lot of sense for that context but makes you understand what it means to fight and win a war sometimes but still winning it and how win in it um, after weeks of fighting Washington so that was commander-in-chief of the Continental Army was forced out of New York and um, it was an undoubted success but deluded the British that and they could win without difficulty in spite of actions such as the one the very famous one of Bunker Hill where basically I think out of 4,500 British um, there were 1,000 casualties in storming the continental positions that in a, in a sense showed the dramatic British resolve but also immediately highlighted the need for much uh, 
more troops than in fact Ho asked immediately to London. And this was a complicated thing because as we will see, basically the uh, the war was won on the oceans rather than on land. But this was uh, an enormous strategic and logistic issue for, for everyone, but especially for the British. And due to an excess of security, the British in fact launched into a complex pincer operation in the north along the Hudson River, famously enough, in two branches, intent on dividing and imprisoning the enemy forces. The first offensive, led from the north by General Burgoyne, ended instead with his surrender on October the 17th, 1777, in Saratoga, in the state of New York, the second, which started from the city of New York and was poorly coordinated with the previous one, was contained by Washington and forced to retrace its steps. It was a turning point in, in the war, right? Saratoga especially, because France, which until then had secretly helped the rebellion, came out in the open and entered the conflict uh, eager for revenge towards Britain for the outcome of the Seven Years' War and the loss, among the others, of the, you know, the massive uh, North American possessions. Um, battles, uh, even minor clashes, um, but still significantly highlighted um, the, the moral force of the Continentals and the broader strategic success in the North convinced other powers that the Americans could successfully defend themselves against the British. Right? This is something we have seen also in the Von Krieg, that no country can expect to receive any help if, first of all, it doesn't demonstrate that it can't successfully defend itself. And we have pretty contemporary and uh, macroscopic evidence of this. Um, and also, military historians about the, the American War of Independence trace around this point up you know, really, not just, in fact, the, the turning point of the, of the conflict, but also the, the actual possibility that the British had at some point, they failed at not moving in, even the Americans said, in, in, in spite of, of this tactical victories, could be still wiped out, right, when they were entrenched in winter camps and so on, as also the, the lost opportunity for the British to actually win the American War of Independence, which is, I think, the fairest judgment, because some, you know, extremes historiographically go and saying, you know, as also, of course, we all admire Washington's wars, uh, speaking of a miracle of the American victory, and one can see it, generally speaking, in this way, right, essentially uh, standing their ground against the most powerful military in the world at that time. Um, but others saying that the strategic and logistic situation was quite prohibitive for the British since the beginning, or I mean to say it could have never won. What is factually more correct is saying that, yes, Saratoga and, generally speaking, other strategic chances lo lost and won for both sides could have really made a, a broader difference, right? And and it was not over yet. Also, by 1780, the, uh, the continue. Uh, the, the Continental Army was dramatically shattered to the point of annihilation, as we will see now. So, um, wars are fought when uh, when the odds are still presenting with a, you know, with victory um, from from your side as a within the realm of reality in, in a consistent fashion. So, um, there was nothing pre to say nothing deterministic about the outcome of the American War of Independence. Now, internationally speaking, in Paris, uh, the, the Americans sent lots of spies agents to also properly support the American cause. There was, um, as we'll see now, an enormous enthusiasm from patriots all, all over Europe that were also fighting in similar situations or that, uh, um, say, were in love with the same ideals of liberty. Um, or sometimes just of you know of, of hostility towards Britain at some point, but not only uh, that the Americans were parading, right? And there would be a broader, you know, uh, you know, participation properly to the 
to the coast, also sometimes from the same troops that were sent at a point, even to fight the Americans. Many, many of the Hessians were sent at, uh, at a point. Many German Americans and immigrants who were coming to North America at that time would also sympathize importantly with the with the American coast because what the the continental uh, the continentals showed on the field and probably with, with their with their ideals with their result their determination in Paris Benjamin Franklin representative of the rebel colonies at the court of Louis the sixteenth had shown surprising diplomatic and propaganda skills by convincing the king and his government to go to war by providing the United States with important contributions in men, ships and hard cash and it wasn't an easy task at all also because the French had already a monstrous debt after the defeat in the Seven Years War they would have had and they would in fact increase it dramatically also in part triggering the same French revolution uh, in the process to support uh, the Americans uh, and also you know ide uh, ideally because many Many of the same French were in love, as we've seen with the, the American ideals after all. Think about figures like Lafayette and also his role uh, in later times, the problems he had with the revolution, with the uh, Napoleonic times and beyond. Um, in any case, um, the French decision, France was the second largest power in the world, so at this point was followed by the accession of Spain. That is somewhat overlooked, right? The French sent much more properly consistent military aid but also the the Spanish uh, the Spanish let's say uh, were still uh, sympathetic of course to the, to the American coast but they didn't come openly uh, in support right they fought only outside America to gain uh, from the British Gibraltar Minorca and Spanish Florida right with French support right well the Americans wouldn't sign a peace treaty without France instead, albeit they, they always uh, maintained unbeknownst of, of the French, uh, of course, a diplomatic channel with, with the British to, to negotiate. Um, the government of Spanish Louisiana, Galvez, in particular, assisted the Americans by attacking British forts and opening, importantly enough, from New Orleans. Um, uh, the navigation on the Mississippi River north to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, supplying the Americans, bypassing the uh, Atlantic uh, blockade of the Royal Navy in the process, which was a big deal because, as we will see now from the British uh, perspective, the strategy was to squeeze the, the, the Americans from basically all four cardinal points. Galvez was also assisted by Pollock, who was... Um, you know, a successful, you know, entrepreneur, let's put it in this way, businessman who uh, helped the Spanish also logistically uh, camping east along the Gulf Coast, uh, coast in, you know, dire terrain, by the way, to, to secure West Florida, including uh, British-held Mobile and Pensacola. Um, also, uh, the Spanish obstacled arms arrival to the to the British Indian allies. The United Provinces, although the Republic was no longer a major power, as we were saying before, prior to 1774, they still dominated the European carrying trade. The Dutch merchants um, thus had made large profits uh, shipping French supplied munitions to the Patriots, and this ended when Britain declared war on Holland in December 1780, uh, a war that proved disastrous, in fact, for the Dutch economy. Even the Sultanate of Missouri in India sided, <laughs> you know, with, with the Americans. Britain could not find a powerful ally among the great powers, um, to, especially to engage France on the European continent, which was the big deal, you know, France being the hegemonic continental power uh, in Europe and uh, this was a good chance after the Seven Years War and the dramatic expansion of Britain becoming factually the first world power surpassing Ming China. 
um, you know, to, to strip the British of part of, of lands. You know, they successfully defended Gibraltar from the Spanish and so on. So it was, you know, uh, uh, in for all, right, to, to make mass to try to an inch. The uh, quite scattered, but also very well connected by especially the British, uh, you know, maritime power, uh, British Empire itself. Um, this why why Saratoga in after that you know was so important because this decision brought the the um, this uh, you know the 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 entry into war of France and other powers obliged the British to change their focus mainly to the Caribbean theater where they were more engaged against the, this other more threatening powers, thus diverting major military resources away from America. Um, and victory would leave. Um, according to them, the United States uh, set, set, cut off from everyone, right? So facing British possessions in the south, Canada, Canada to the north, and Ohio on their western border, while uh, the Atlantic seaboard would have been controlled by the Royal Navy. This is how the British thought that the American Congress would be forced to agree to terms. However, assumptions especially about the level of loyalist support in America proved to be wildly optimistic. The southern strategy that brought properly the um, the British to to drive away from the northern theater of the same American colonies and to intervene in the south depended also on local support, right? But this was undermined by a series of coercive measures that the British needed to, to operate in the colonies. Um, loyalists were also unevenly distributed locally on, on uh, and territorially, um, and or couldn't be easily levied. For example, many lived among large plantation owners. Uh, in the Tidewater region and South Carolina, who produced cash crops in tobacco and in indigo that were comparable to the to, to the global markets in Caribbean sugar that the British also were heavily interested in. So, were all a, um, a series of you know complications that the initial uh, political mandate for the the war against the Americans had not fully considered. Great Britain realized soon that she had a much tougher task ahead of her than expected, especially after 1778. Uh, the widening of the conflict, in fact, not only brought new adversaries to the continental theater, but that was something London had to fear, but forced the British to disperse their forces to counter the new foes in, in their bases and in their colonies. The Royal Navy, in particular, experienced a radical change in the situation, finding itself facing not only smugglers and pirates, as we will see now, but entire national fleets. The escalation of the war and the international isolation of the British Kingdom, however, did not discourage the king and his government at all, more than ever determined to continue hostilities until the revocation of the Declaration of Independence. The war became something of a grueling puzzle for both sides. The king's troops, at the cost of high tributes of blood, always, at least almost always, managed to free cities and provinces from the continental army. However, as soon as they abandoned a conquest to go to other areas, the rebels invariably regained possession by driving out the garrison. Washington wrote to Henry Lawrence, one of the founding fathers, referring to the revolutionary spirit of the population, quote, that the possession of our towns, while we have an army in the field, will avail them, the British, little. And this is, aside from the retaliations and the deep divisions that also the, the American War of Independence did bring uh, locally. There is to consider that unlike Europe, where the fall of a capital city often ended wars, because basically the entire country depended on it, like Paris, London, right? Uh, 
and everything could be negotiated in a sense on that base. In America, um, wars continued even after the loss of major settlements such as Philadelphia, the, the seat of Congress, New York and Charleston. Equally delicate for the British were thus the relations with the populace. The presence of loyalists in every area of the colonies prevented an indiscriminate use of force for fear of triggering a bloody flywheel of reciprocal reprisals, a risk that the King's army had not known, for example, in Ireland and Scotland, where repressions had been effectively ruthless. Um, and this is to be, to be said that, aside, as we will see now, from, from the Hessians, whose cruelties have also been uh, kind of bit magnified by successful and very cleverly by continental propaganda, the British troops were somewhat very, you know, polite for the time standards also for their own, right? whereas in the Celtic fringe, of course, they wouldn't give a damn about. Uh, however, 30,000 of Hessians, which is a synecdoche for the Germans enlisted uh, by the king, true contracts stipulated with their princes um, of these 30,000, 13,000 become casualties uh, in, the, in the War of Independence. I mean, mostly as deserting, but the rest being actually killed because they were used uh, quite uh, ruthlessly, of course, in that sense, contributed to the British war effort as much, however, as they exer exacerbated the relations with the colonists. The brutality, looting, and destruction the Germans were responsible for became legendary, even though for a clever propaganda action by the rebels. The king was accused of declaring war on his own subjects by using such foreign mercenaries, leading to the idea that there were now two separate governments within the American colonies. The myth of the Hessians, militarily speaking, died soon at Trenton on December 26, 1776, when Washington inflicted the Germans over 1,500 losses among prisoners, dead, wounded, and missing. Speaking of the strategic theater of the southern colonies, many battles would be fought between patriots and loyalists with no British involvement. And this caused the loyalist militias in the south being constantly defeated by neighboring patriot militia, which crippled them irreversibly after the Battle of King's Mountain in 1780. This led in turn to divisions that continued after independence was achieved among the, the Americans. During the war of the American Revolution, intelligence operations played a role of fundamental importance. It's estimated that Washington, who was a true precursor in this field by setting up a, a, um, a branch network of spies in each colony, drawing vital information for the outcome of the war and influencing local public opinion with counter-information works, uh, spent up to 10% of the entire military budget on intelligence. Um, so this gives you an idea also how concretely important it was for, the, for their messages, American spies used a special sympathetic ink which reacted only to a secret chemical compound. The intelligence gathered helped dramatically on multiple occasions, almost vitally, the American strategic effort. Washington was also responsible for the creation of an organization specifically dedicated to counterintelligence to from the British, ex established after a failed attempt on his life, orchestrated by, by the enemy. Another protagonist of the war of intelligence was Benjamin Franklin, that was quite of a hand for sure among the, the many that surely fought uh, the war many ways, pro by providing to be brilliant, in fact, also in this activity, to provoke the desertion of the German mercenaries, he spread a false letter between an unspecified prince and his commander in America, where he claimed 
uh, more deaths among his soldiers and therefore a higher uh, reimbursement from the British while to raise the indignation of the population he published a perfectly credible edition of a newspaper which reported that the British government of Canada paid his Indian allies for each American scalp including women and children uh, there were from Canada some expedition the, the Americans initially as you know tried also to to take uh, Quebec failing then there were other um, raids launched from the French Canadians natives um, and the thing naturally natives extended also much further south along all the uh, the, the frontier um, the Americans for their part were irremediably distressed by the supply of troops their training and above all their payment weapons and ammunition could not be produced sufficiently locally and depended on imports by sea from allied countries subject to the merciless surveillance of the Royal Navy um, the main problem in this sense of, is of course that the United States had started the war without a real military they were essentially just militias they had to equip themselves by themselves um, during the conflict in many ways before larger aid and finally the um, the logistic routes were were open with the um, uh, especially after the battle of Chesapeake the dispersion of the Royal Navy and they, they wouldn't have practically much to keep themselves with in the first place the city militias whose men were called minute men because they had to respond to the call of arms in a minute were too unreliable as well and unsuitable for a war uh, of that magnitude and contrary to the belief that there were some kind of um, guerrillas however the Americans succeeded on the longer run to patiently transform them into a regular and disciplined arm um, at the Battle of Monmouth in 1778 the Continentals repulsed British bayonet charges including a Black Rhode Island regiment fending off a British bayonet attack then counter charging for the first time in Washington's army. Baron Friedrich Wilhelm von Steuben took the opportunity to introduce Prussian army drill and infantry tactics to the entire Continental Army, right, composing by himself the Revolutionary War, War Drill Manual. Um, Germantown, 1777, um, the Continentals led by Washington almost mm, ruined the the British army, um, being defeated in the process, but basically, you know, displaying an incredible capacity, uh, both in command and morally. Right after this battle, by the way, Hull could have moved on the American camp at the end of the season uh, and simply ending the war because also the logistical situations in, in the north were, were appalling. I mean the soldiers had nothing, it was terrifying and the thing wouldn't end also in the following years. But a German town, the genius and audacity shown by Washington in, in thus um, planning and so nearly accomplished the ruin of the British army only three weeks after the defeat at uh, the Brandywine produced a um, profound impression upon military critics in Europe. The same Frederick the second of Prussia so that presently when American soldiers should come to be disciplined veterans they would become a very formidable instrument in the hands of a great commander. Frederick also refused to provide passage to his territories for troops hired for the American war that as we have seen also for the way the European troops were ruthlessly recruited at the time it's a big deal. Um, the French court in making up their minds that the Americans would prove efficient allies um, were said to have been uh, influenced almost as much by the Battle of Germantown as by the surrender of Burgoyne that had occurred previously and um, the, the point however is of course that the Continentals never could match uh, in, in overall terms the quality of the British troops also suffering uh, 
an astonishing amount of losses throughout the war, uh, being captured mostly and essentially dying for the majority, aside from smallpox epidemics that seems to have wiped out 100,000 people all over the American colonies during the war. In the prison ships in New York's harbor, um, the British cared pretty much. Also, they, they wouldn't leave even after the peace before uh, the Americans would render them their own prisoners uh, instead. Um, the British were simply, you know, the finest at the time in terms of uh, drill, discipline, uh, competent officials, trained, well, very well trained and equipped troops. The Americans had none of this, right? And so they always suffered of such structural uh, gap that they never filled, right? Um, and there wasn't even much previous experience that they had gained. I mean, yes, the the Americans had fought, as we've seen in the Seven Years' War, in the French-Indian War, um, but as militiamen. So the, the experience they could get was still insufficient by the same level of, of properly of, uh, for which they were trained and, and employed. Um, some officers, of course, had um, an important um, experience gained in those theaters, especially in the frontier, where the militias, generally speaking, didn't fare badly against the the Indians that were just, you know, they didn't have the, the discipline and the, the effectiveness of the of the of the Western armies in open field. Um, but there were too few, right? And most uh, officers um, were inexperienced during the war, and so on. And so this heavily informed the tactics and the same strategy of the Continental Army that, generally speaking, preferred to avoid, um, you know, facing uh, the, the Redcoats um, in open field face to face. And that, however, proved very resilient in attritional warfare, also in guerrilla, in harassment, and, and so on. And their presence was pretty much mixed again because they were fighting. There was a civil war. Right uh, w uh, within Americans, and so you couldn't even tell who was who by a certain degree. And again, the British couldn't really use the real iron fist against the the civilians at the point of indicating themselves. For was already, by the way, quite um, you know the, the the reason of the war in the first place and its consequences. Uh, the same size of the Continental Army was modest. Washington, as we were saying, never commanded more than seventeen thousand men. Uh, also lost more battles than the ones he won, but he never surrendered, even though, you know, he, he went pretty close. I mean, you know, it really would have, this is not to be given for granted. They went pretty close to that on multiple occasions, but they ever always managed to, to pull out successfully. Um, even the, f uh, the Franco-Americans altogether, the, the French were sending troops that, by the way, were commanded by American officers, very interestingly enough, and not only were so French officers, of course, but they were pro properly provided by France as, as be part of the continental, uh, to be under continental command. Uh, at Yorktown uh, were only 19,000. And it's calculated that about 250,000 men served as regulars or as militia for the revolutionary cause over eight years um, during wartime. But there were never more than 90,000 men under arms at one time. And again, many of them were, were militia. Uh, the most difficult problem for the Americans altogether, however, was financing war expenses. Congress had the same difficulties as the British in collecting taxes locally because at least I mean, the Americans were just, uh, you know, that, that's all they, they could draw, right, before uh, external help arrived. So um, in, in any case, this would have never been sufficient to finance the very high costs of the conflict, also given the chronic shortage of currency that at some point was practically worthless just paper to pay the troops. In fact, a large amount of paper money was then printed, the so-called continentals, with the result of causing a surge in inflation and the depreciation of the currency up to 
100 of its initial value. And this was a, a form of indirect taxa taxation for the American government. Um, Washington worked closely with the officer Benjamin, Benjamin Lincoln to coordinate a, a civilian and military authorities, and taking charge of training and supplying the army, so that's forming that important bridge that is necessary uh, to win any war between politics and its military instrument. Uh, courage definitely constituted the strength of the American army on many occasions, given that they were too militarily inferior to the British in, in the other aspects of warfare. And the episodes of courage are innumerable, of course, like in any war, General Joseph Warren was a fervent separatist, and in the run-up to the Battle of Bunker Hill on June 17th, 1775, after which General Gage was removed, even because of the astonishing amount of, of losses against the American defense, he decided to fight as a private, and he found himself in the thick of the action when the defense of the American Central Small Fort was about to yield to, to yet another assault, and he was killed by a rifle shot while protecting the retreat of his fellow soldiers, and uh, recognized by the enemy, his body was battered by countless vengeful bayonets. Um, in the initial phase of the conflict, one of the very few American units that could boast full equipment from bayonets to uniform was the 1st Regiment of Delaware, 750 men who found their baptism of fire during the Battle of Long Island on August 27, 1776. They basically resisted for four hours to repeated enemy attacks conducted by much superior forces. It was only a diversionary action. Washington at that point could have been wiped out. The, the British didn't just push further. They, he just, you know... Uh, saved his army um, through crossing to 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 Manhattan with um, with some flat bottom boats and uh, exploiting the the thick fog. The the Royal Navy was just there. Yes, the you know New York had some kind of uh, uh, naval artillery, anti-naval artillery, let's say, in uh, in sight. But you know there. The, the war could have ended there, practically, and that's also how the Northern Theater developed uh, along the Hudson, because the British basically just chased them further north. Um, and, um, and and this episode is, is quite interesting. The Battle of Long Island is, is fantastic, because it always shows, first of all, that in any battle there is a unit that sacrifices itself for, you know, allowing the rest of the army to retreat. Um, but, let's say, um, the British weren't different in, the, in this sense. They were stubborn um, in bending the resistance of the colonists, and because of the stand of the 1st Regiment of Delaware, they paid a high tribute of blood as well. Um, the Americans had substantially shown they, couldn't, they could stand up to the best professional infantry in the world. During the Battle of Princeton on January the 3rd, 1777, Washington proved not only his charisma, but above all the effectiveness of the network of spies it had organized in the territories occupied by the British. In fact, informed that the city of Princeton was poorly defended, he attacked it after having evaded the surveillance of the troops facing him at night. And the defense was, however, strenuous and only a direct intervention by him convinced the fleeing militiamen to return to fight. When speaking of charisma, right at the decisive moment of the clash, Washington even led the fire of his men uh, by himself with his back to the enemy, like an orchestra director. Um, and you would think, yes, they th those muskets had a uh, few precision, they, you know, but in standing like that, under that volume of fire, can tell you, you need massive guts, not to say uh, else. A war that had only nominally began for economic reasons was 
essentially turning to a global economic crisis that threatened to overwhelm Britain and the United States, yes, but also France and its European allies, providing solid arguments to those who supported peace. This is a burden that pressures in the mandate of the military action as well. The British generals from the field were stressing the need of of supplies, right? Not just of troops. Was even in, more troops would have was even in, since the beginning. Um, it's been estimated at some point just ten thousand more British troops could make the difference. But the cost of that, politically, socially, and considering the other strategic theaters, is what makes the entirety of of the war. Um, King George the Third and his government, however, chose to react with an iron fist. Uh, the intent was to punish the rebels by bleeding them to death in a war that would be won by the exhaustion of the opponent. Which, in that situation, they should have probably seen better. Was kind of more uh, describing their own situation on the long run. But it was possible to achieve this result, um, regardless of the tragic repercussions on the loyalists. It was planned to occupy only a few strongholds and to squeeze the colonies in a pincer from the sea, with the siege and bombing of the coastal cities, and from land, given the green light, to raids by Indian tribes. And persistent Iroquois attacks along the border with Quebec led to the punitive Sullivan expedition, for example, for, by, by the Patriots in April 1779, which destroyed many of the Indian settlements, but failed to stop the raids. So it was always a thorn in the side in the West. Uh, the, the British military also had considerable experience themselves of fighting in North America already, most recently during the Seven Years' War, which forced France to give up, in fact, New France in 1763, that now was fighting alongside Britain. Um, so, defeated in the northern colonies, where the Patriots were the strongest, the British changed theater, seeking greater fortune in the southern ones, as we were hinting at before, while reinforcing their position in New York. At this point, Howe resigned, was replaced by Clinton. Um, the British argued it, it made no sense to fight, it, to fight the Patriots in the North, where they, they were the strongest, uh, where you know, a, a push through would have been too exp expansive in terms of cost-benefit ratio, while the New England economy was reliant on trade with Britain, regardless of who governed it. The American armies in those regions um, of the South were defeated one after another. Battles such as the ones of Camden, Savannah, the uh, Max House, the two attempts the British conquest and the attempt of American reconquest of Savannah. Mid. And after the surrender of Charleston on May the 12th, 1780, the American resistance almost completely collapsed. Essentially continuing only in the form of guerrilla warfare by partisan formations. This was the the one at Charleston was the most serious Patriot defeat of the war. Right, over 5,000 prisoners were taken and the Continental Army in the South was effectively destroyed. However, the Americans were not yet defeated and they proved it by sending new troops under a new general, Nathaniel Green. Um, Washington had substituted him to Gates. And, um, and a new Fabian, so scorched earth strategy, aimed at avoiding decisive clashes with the British and to wear them down attritionally in the long run. And the, the British assumption loyalists would do most of the fighting uh, in this theater of operations left uh, the same British short of troops. Uh, and battlefield victories 
that would be achieved, of course, uh, because of British uh, open field superiority still, however, came at, at the cost of losses that in that political and logistical situation were could could not they, they could not r replace reinforcements had to come from Europe and maintaining large armies over such distances was extremely complex ships could take three months to cross the Atlantic and orders from London were often outdated by the time they arrived so this uh, sensibly reduced um, also properly the, the, the ability uh, not much just of the of the British armies but properly of, of their of their command because there were also rivalries uh, in the in the chain uh, lack of coordination also lack of coordination with the Royal Navy which was another issue the British had quote we fight we are defeated we rise again and we fight again was the motto of Green General Green who validly assisted by his collaborators among whom the then little more than 20 year old Marquis of Lafayette distinguished himself obtained the expected results unable to destroy American forces for their elusive behavior British General Cornwallis tried to starve them by attacking their granary that is Virginia his men however were by now too few to conquer a state of that size was enormous uh, and again th this thing you know you know the colonies stretched further in the interland for a big extent and also thanks to the misunderstandings due to the misunderstanding at least from a British perspective with his own general uh, command his staff too far from the theater of operations the invasion ended in failure and uh, Cornwallis had opted essentially for an aggressive plan to isolate Green's army in Virginia and in order to safeguard the colony the Patriots decided to risk by collecting the, the, the challenge and you know uh, facing the British army but Clinton misinterpreted the Continentals movement as if they would attack New York instead and reinforced thus uh, positions and Royal Navy support there leaving Cornwallis isolated this is what brought to the siege of Yorktown um, this was a port city uh, uh, and the essentially the, the the mixed American and French contingent uh, besieged the British army that would be forced to surrender on October the 19th 1781 after the French fleet had defeated the British one it's a, a last attempt to keep open a maritime escape route for the ill-fated army and and this also was not um, to be given for granted Cornwallis for example uh, lost the chance to engage Lafayette before he could establish siege lines even worse expecting to be withdrawn within a few days uh, he mm, abandoned the outer defenses and and this siege as you know this the, the British defeat at Yorktown was the main reason of, of the American victory albeit the war dragged on for, for other years and it was a great debate regarding responsibility um, Clinton ultimately took most of the blame and spent the rest of his life in obs obscurity Cornwallis had other um, employments let's say also in India etc but um, this exposes also the the issues of um, the internal issues of British uh, coordination especially the, the war of the American independence was actually fought and won mostly over the oceans by which terrestrial warfare was heavily influenced the American war economy was largely dependent on maritime imports in the months immediately following the outbreak of facilities the highly efficient crowd of smugglers who had either to acted covertly 
circumvented British laws, becoming the driving force of the legal, let's say, trade with um, naturally beneficial effects on the American economy. However, the Royal Navy soon adopted adequate countermeasures, causing serious damage to the American military. American imports thus had to return to being based on the smuggling fleet, to which were added the spoils of privateering supported by captains who became, um, for this reason, real, say, American heroes in the national mythology, such as, for example, John Paul Jones, who would become also a rare admiral at some point in, in the Russian Navy of Catherine the Great, and who, he, who was famous for his raids on the Irish coast. Um, for most of the war, however, the Continental Navy consisted of a handful of small frigates and sloops, supported by numerous privateers. The turning point came in 1780, when, starting in that year from France, the European powers began to deploy their fleets alongside the colonies in revolt, as we have seen, and supported by the French Navy and blockade runners based in the Dutch Caribbean, the Patriots' economy was able to survive. Conversely, the British Army was constantly handicapped by chronic supply issues, which considerably slowed down their operational capability. George Washington immediately understood the strategic importance of, of this contribution. Great Britain, in fact, soon began to bear the brunt of international isolation and to suffer of, of its effects, not only on the American coasts of the Atlantic Ocean, but basically wherever there were British interests, because they were all connected uh, by the, the, the link that the Royal Navy could offer. And at this point, uh, uh, this was committed was outstretched right to the point of re rendering this links ever thinner. And unable to make far-sighted strategic choices, the British Admiralty in fact dispersed the Royal Navy, trying to block opponents in the ports of every theater of war, but thus inevitably finding themselves outnumbered everywhere. Right? And the most striking and decisive result was the French victory in the naval battle of Chesapeake on September the 5th, 1781, which basically paved the way to the arrival of French heavy artillery and closed those of British supplies instead, making the British surrender of Yorktown inevitable. The French uh, brought in heavy artillery. Uh, they attacked also from the sea, so uh, that was really a, a major turning point. This naturally uh, brought to further uh, to the further o opening of the doors of supply to the Americans uh, everywhere, right? For, for the the broader war effort um, and the backing of their newly born country. Despite the defeat of Yorktown, King George the Third was still stubbornly intent on an all-out war, but. Not so by now, the majority of Parliament was, which forced him to enter into secret peace talks while military operations actually continued, albeit with diminished intensity. The Americans were one step away from victory and did not let the chance pass. For the next two years, they entered into intense negotiations, as we were saying before, keeping their French and Spanish allies in, in the dark. Uh, because they still had uh, in their future uh, an important relation with Britain to, to maintain. And with the Treaty of Paris of 1783, the Americans obtained the certification of their definitive independence, and also a particularly favorable treaty which left open some future disputes on the continent in the process, because that kind of you know, still commixium that had existed before le did leave some trace. This uh, ha was in particular concerning the, the native tribes who were deprived of the protection of King George III. Exchange the British, uh, in addition to sovereignty over Canada that they retained, were able to enter into separate treaties with Spain and France, which were, however, much less generous. Uh, in particular with 
the France of King Louis the Sixteenth, who found himself with an economy in ruins. This is being predicted by his Ministry of, of fin Finance, um, due to a debt that had skyrocketed, um, and also, you know, at that point, this newborn republic and a good reason to to make um, a revolution and a model to imitate to make it happen, except things w would go disastrously wrong uh, in that case, at least before things turned turn better on the longer run, with, with consequences that were, in a sense, and definitely much more devastating, especially for Europe, as you know. The last of the British occupation of New York City ended on November the 25th, 1783, with the departure of Clinton's replacement, General Sir Guy Carleton, and the losses of the American War of Independence can be enlightening uh, in a way. Aside from the death by illness, that was by far the most common. We mentioned before the smallpox epidemics killed probably 130,000 people on a population of not even 2 millions, right? So consider plus the war, etc. Up to 70,000 American patriots died during active military service alone, right? And of these 68 Hundred. These are estimates, of course, but they were killed in battle. Um, Seventeen thousand died from disease, as we've seen. The majority in prison. Instead, we're not talking about the disabled, as well. That range probably, you know, were something between ten, twenty thousand. The French lost uh, more than two thousand killed in action in the United States. Uh, nor not abroad that was larger. The Spanish also had uh, just a hundred in uh, West Florida. A British report in 1781 puts the total army deaths at 6,000 in North America during the time, and it's considered that uh, 7,700 Hessians died in British service almost 5,000 actually deserting and also actually having an, a future in the United States later on. And of um, this uh, German deaths, 1,800 were in combat. So it's difficult to conclude a video that squeezes, compresses so brutally such uh, an important event in modern history like the, the American War of Independence. My, uh, my advice in general, even though I'm a, just a humble medievalist that tries to talk mostly about the art of war, and so today we, we didn't maybe even start getting in the, in the details of, of the American War of Independence, and we can't talk about it again in... Um, Pleasantly, say it's just not my focus, um, but surely we will, uh, if you know, at least hopefully, time allowing, um, is to never give for granted, in my opinion, um, the um, you know what it means to uh, political liberty in a in a practical sense. Uh, not much because of the American holiday in itself, its meaning, the historical legacy of, of the War of Independence, etc. But through mm, the understanding of the difference that the military instruments make politically for everybody. This is also British history, after all, um, and also a French one and a Spanish one. And for all the, also the, the many people who fought from everywhere, um, coming from everywhere, literally, in, uh, in in the United States. This would happen later on also with the, the American Civil War. So I know that there is a lot of debate regarding, uh, I mean, today's United States, uh, there are many, there's much uh, iconoclasm, and uh, 
from a part of the population, uh, self-hatred and some sort of sense of defeatism or, or lack of, of orientation or properly, you know, an idea that, you know, that there is something that, you know, is being eroded or is not coming back again on its feet. I think that the, one of, if not the greatest reason of American success in itself is exactly the full understanding as the initial, uh, you know, answer by Preston in in the interview uh, where he was a very old man uh, and a veteran of the war uh, answering Mellon Chamberlain is realizing actually how simple and how clear and how rational the order of things really is and how history is uh, sometimes does seem difficult to 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 learn in the first place or and or to accept and it's very easy especially when we we know a lot of things but we don't have any form keeping it together because in, because we haven't made a thorough effort to to use that critical skill we haven't properly worked on it we haven't really focused on it excessively to be to be influenced to be misled to be you know distracted uh, by those who want to eliminate fundamentally the, any logic in any um, um, any meaning from from humanity, right? Because when we talk history, we talk about that fundamentally. We don't study the history of rocks and pretending that that's history. We, we study politics, we study war, we study society. And I think that the American War of Independence, devoid of any form of rhetoric or even partisan uh, you know attitude and it, I know it's it's hard especially for such a you know uh, the, the properly for the positivity of the same consequence of this event and and the the meaning in fact that wants to be uh, that some want to tear down accordingly exactly because of its effectiveness is really what we should go back and, and have to as not just as Americans but as as humans universally because this war does speak a universal language it does speak it in, as all history does but highlighting if you want in a as only wars can do in a sense but specifically in this war as the exceptionality of it the uniqueness of it right because the, there has been no other thing practically and even though many peoples fought for their own independence um, the context the background the protagonists are different as they all are right in in Europe we could have not had our war of independence because even though we all more or less come from countries that at some point fought for their own independence and were in another um, we, um, we, we, we are too intertwined and somewhat, you know, stratified in some mechanisms that could have not made a country like the United States being born, right, and escaping eventually um, uh, the motherland and building a world that, uh, on its own, that at some point is perhaps the only true obstacle, I presume, that derives sometimes this self-referentiality of um, American political culture that in its deterior forms uh, degenerates in things like isolationism as some sort of, you know, um, and declined at so many levels everywhere, also in Europe, for, for what our ideals of independence, and again, do have that common core of universality, really, really meant. But again, history does give you all the answers. There is no, there shouldn't be, historically speaking, uh, a sort of, you know, um, iconoclasm, of uh, radical revisionism, of um, even when, of course, certain patterns of interpretation do seem um, really too forced, right? The other day was, I was reading in preparation of this video, one of my old manuals, and just to refresh my memory about the basics, and, and I was noticing, even just having spent many years talking about medieval history without opening it again how in a sense even properly the concept of modernity has been um, abused of as if you know modernity 
was just born at that point. It wasn't something progressed, right? And we were to just float into nothingness as if, you know, all what we did as humans before didn't contain, after all, a bit of what the same founding fathers perfectly knew, what was part of the same American independent uh, independence uh, ideas. Um, so um, this requires effort, dedication, and as you know, I'm not a nationalist, I'm not a socialist, so I really believe in tradition and in universality. And for this very reason, however, I do realize that a patriotic feeling, um, a legitimate love for your own country, as you are unavoidably uh, part of it, right, in the, in the somatic element of it, in a way, is, is, is natural. Right, and if you don't extremize it, if you don't radicalize it, if you don't make it become a fundamentalistic ideology, is always the first, um, which which happens exactly when you stop studying or learning anything about that, because you presume that you all you have these things just because you were born there. It has nothing to do with that for any country, right? Um, all our values are acquired. Right? It's not because you're born by chance. Uh, here or there, whatever, uh, it makes any difference, right? It's what you come to learn, and this is what properly the concept of a nation stands in, is in the political cohesion, in, in a common understanding that can derive, obviously, only from the seeking of those truths that the Founding Fathers thought to be self-evident, because they are self-evident for everyone, not just for America, and that's what, what, why the future of the United States was so radius um, and incredible and unique right to this day where you know uh, the United States suffered much worse times and we tend to overly dramatize because if we are dramatically devoid of moral resistance at this point everything we make a fuss for even the most stupid things and we, we, we lose the plot anyhow we, we, we lose the point of reference and this is easily overcome just by reading of these stories, by realizing that there is a history w within which they fit, right? And that learning history as a whole is the only key to give meaning to the single events. So never cease searching for those same ideals that you may be more inspired by because you are American, but because they are, let's say, an achievement that your country scored in in a in a hierarchy of values that we are all searching for and that we can always find a common uh, ground of. So this is the most um, important thing that I can think of and that is a bit the sap of my own historical belief. And that's for this reason that I that again I wish my American audience a, a beautiful uh, July the 4th, as Apu, I will tell, you know, celebrate uh, the independence of your country, making, you know, blowing up a part of it, and um, that is quite loud, as you know, it's not a uh, an independence war reference, but a later one, but in any case, um, I would think, uh, as any historical uh, you know, event uh, and the protagonist of it and those who carry the legacy of it in this civic responsibility as citizens of a country for what this event taught the world and, and still does, right, for the universal value that it really embodies and that contained much more tradition than what you are, what we are supposed to think from a kind of more, more liberal narrative uh, as if the world had been born just with Enlightenment revolutions, which was not actually the Enlightenment revolutions were all the same, and it wasn't just uh, a good Enlightenment, nor just a bad Enlightenment. Um, and also, what, however, still this brought in the path of civilization, that is acquired, because that is an achievement that you have to build step by step. It just doesn't work with wishful thinking. So looking even just at the losses of the American Civil War, this proportion, the Americans dead uh, in, in, in the enterprise, but the ultimate success of victory, what they earned for their future, I, I believe that that is uh, a very important chance to 
to celebrate and to remember and to and to reflect upon as always it's only history can make it so for today i just stop it here i hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content and for now i thank you heartily for listening to me i wish you a nice time and see you next time bye